Welcome back to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today we're going to cover topic 4.4, water pollution. Water pollution is a major global issue that affects both human societies and natural ecosystems. Throughout this video, we're going to explore the various types of water pollutants, how we measure water quality, and strategies for managing pollution in aquatic systems. Let's get into it. Let's begin by examining water systems and how pollutants move through them. When we look at a water system, we can identify various entry points for pollutants, including surface runoff, groundwater discharge, and direct inputs through wells or other sources. Both natural and human activities can introduce pollutants into water systems. Looking at nutrient pollution in major water bodies like the Gulf of Mexico or Chesapeake Bay, we see that agricultural activities contribute significantly to both phosphorus and nitrogen loads. In the Gulf of Mexico, crops account for about 43% of phosphorus and 66% of nitrogen inputs, while livestock operations add 37% of all the phosphorus. While many pollution sources initially affect freshwater systems, they can ultimately impact marine environments as well. Urban runoff, agricultural activities, industrial discharge, and atmospheric deposition all contribute to both freshwater and marine pollution through the interconnected nature of our water systems. Water pollutants come in many forms. One of the most visible is floating debris, particularly plastic waste that accumulates on beaches and in our oceans. These images from beaches in Bali and Tanzania show how widespread this problem has become. Nutrient pollution, particularly from nitrates and phosphates, represents another major challenge. As we saw earlier, these nutrients come from various sources, with agriculture being usually the biggest contributor. Suspended solids, like the sediment we see flowing into Lake Tuscaloosa, can severely impact water quality. This type of pollution often results from construction, from agriculture, and from other land use changes that increase erosion. Thermal pollution, or heat pollution, that's shown here in this thermal plume diagram from Portugal, significantly affects aquatic ecosystems by altering water temperature patterns and oxygen levels. Most aquatic organisms have an ideal temperature range in which they thrive. And if the temperature is either too low or too high, it stresses them out and their populations decline. Biological pollutants, such as invasive species like this water hyacinth in Cambodia, can dramatically alter aquatic ecosystems because it outcompetes native species and it can also change habitat conditions by shading out the environment under the surface of the water. To assess water quality scientifically, we use multiple parameters and measurements. These fall into several categories. Physical properties like pH, temperature and turbidity, measurements of solids and organic matter, and analysis of nutrient levels in the water. Each of these parameters tells us something different about the health of that water system. When organic pollutants enter a water system, they undergo biodegradation by microorganisms. This process requires oxygen, and under suitable conditions of pH and temperature, microorganisms break down organic matter into simpler compounds. However, if too much organic matter is present, this process depletes oxygen from the water because the biochemical oxygen demand becomes so high. This leads to a crucial measure of water quality called biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD. In this graph, BOD and dissolved oxygen have an inverse relationship. The higher the demand for oxygen from living things, that's BOD, the lower the amount of dissolved oxygen that remains in the water. When sewage enters a water system, decomposers multiply rapidly to break down the organic matter, and they consume oxygen in the process through respiration. This creates a characteristic pattern where dissolved oxygen levels drop dramatically before gradually recovering downstream. Nature provides us with biological indicators of water quality through certain sensitive species. This diagram shows how different organisms tolerate different levels of pollution. Stonefly nymphs, for instance, require very clean water, so we only find them in water that's clean and we don't find them in heavily polluted water. But tubifex worms can survive in really heavily polluted conditions, so their populations tend to be lower in clean areas where they're outcompeted by other organisms. We can quantify these biological indicators using what's called a biotic index. These calculations take into account both the number of organisms present and their pollution tolerance ratings. Looking at these two sample sites, we can see how a higher biotic index indicates better water quality. One of the most serious forms of water pollution is eutrophication. 
This image shows a severe algal bloom caused by excess nutrients entering this aquatic system. The characteristic green color comes from a dense population of algae that are thriving on high levels of nitrates and phosphates entering the water. The process of eutrophication follows a really predictable pattern. First, excess nutrients enter the water, and second, that triggers algal blooms. Third, when those algae die, their decomposition depletes oxygen from the water. And fourth, that creates an anoxic condition. That's a condition without oxygen. And that condition kills fish and other aquatic life. Here, we see efforts to manage eutrophication in Cambodia's Siem Reap River, where workers physically remove algae. While this addresses the immediate symptom, long-term solutions must target the sources of the nutrient pollution in the first place. The ultimate consequence of severe oxygen depletion is the formation of dead zones like this one in the Gulf of Mexico. These areas can't support most marine life due to a lack of oxygen, and that creates vast biological deserts in our oceans. To address water pollution effectively, we use a three-tiered pollution management approach. We'll see this not only in water pollution, but with other forms of pollution within the syllabus. The first tier focuses on preventing pollution through education, legislation, and changing human behavior. Remember that tier one pollution management strategies are generally the most effective, but also the hardest to implement because they require changing people's habits and their mindsets. The second tier involves controlling pollutant release through treatment and regulation. Tier two strategies don't prevent the creation of the pollutant, they just slow or stop its release into the environment. This reduces, but doesn't eliminate the negative impacts of the pollutant on the ecosystem. The final tier of pollution management strategies encompasses the cleanup and restoration of damaged ecosystems. These tier three strategies, cleaning up pollutants that have already been released and restoring ecosystems that have already been damaged, aren't particularly effective because they don't address the root cause of the pollution at all. If the source of the pollutant doesn't change, the cleaned and restored ecosystem just gets polluted again. This is why tier three pollution management strategies are both expensive and ineffective. Cleanup has to happen repeatedly and the root cause of the pollution is still there. On your ESS exam, you probably have to analyze pollution data from somewhere in the world and then connect it to ideas in the ESS syllabus. This first graph shows pollution levels from different countries. So you can connect pollution levels to economic development and industrialization levels in MEDCs and LEDCs. In this graph, we can see several trends in this water pollution data from Ireland between 1971 and 2009. The total number of reported fish kills peaked in the late 1980s at around 235 cases each year. Since then, it's declined significantly to fewer than 100 cases annually. Agriculture was initially the dominant source of pollution that caused these fish kills, but its contribution has decreased pretty notably over time. This likely reflects improved farming practices and stricter regulations on agricultural runoff. Industrial pollution shows a notable decline, although it remained a pretty significant source all the way through the late 90s. Let's revisit the process of eutrophication again because it shows up on ESS exams pretty regularly. Eutrophication begins when excess nutrients, particularly nitrates and phosphates from fertilizers, sewage, or urban runoff, enter a water body. These nutrients trigger explosive growth of algae and aquatic plants, and that creates visible blooms that turn the water green or brown. When this plant life dies, it sinks to the bottom where bacteria decompose it. The decomposition process rapidly consumes dissolved oxygen from the water because those bacteria are undergoing respiration in order to eat all of that algae. So that oxygen is consumed faster than it can be replenished from the atmosphere. As the oxygen levels drop, fish and other oxygen dependent organisms either die or they flee they go somewhere else bottom dwelling organisms which are unable to escape usually die first their deaths and their decomposition create a devastating feedback loop this is positive feedback more dead organisms mean more decomposition and that further depletes oxygen through the respiration of the decomposers eventually this is what creates those dead zones where only anaerobic bacteria and extremely tolerant organisms can survive the use of indicator species provides a powerful biological tool for assessing water quality different aquatic organisms have varying tolerances for pollution making them natural indicators of water conditions let's examine three key indicator species first 
Stonefly nymphs are particularly sensitive to pollution, and they require high levels of dissolved oxygen. Finding them in a water body strongly suggests a clean, well-oxygenated condition with minimal pollution in that site. Their presence typically indicates a biotic index value below 4.0, and that represents excellent water quality. Second, freshwater shrimp can tolerate moderate levels of pollution, but they still need relatively good water quality to survive. They occupy this middle ground in pollution tolerance, which makes them useful indicators of intermediate water quality conditions. Their presence typically suggests a biotic index value between 4.0 and 6.0. Third, tube effects worms. In contrast, these are really tolerant of pollution and they can survive in severely degraded conditions with really low oxygen levels. When we find only tube effects worms with few or no other species present, that's usually an indicator of really significant pollution problems, typically corresponding to a biotic index value above 7. By surveying these species and other indicator species, scientists can assess water quality without relying solely on chemical tests. The presence, absence, and relative abundance of these organisms provide a time-integrated picture of water quality that spot chemical sampling might miss. Finally, you need to remember that water pollution is inherently an international issue. Water systems don't respect political boundaries and addressing pollution requires global cooperation. This raises important questions about responsibility, equity, and the relationship between environmental and social systems. That's it for ESS Topic 4.4, Water Pollution. Until next time, happy learning.